let's get started. So in, in the limiting reactants laboratory, we are looking fundamentally at what major reaction between what two chemical species? Or if you can answer in an alternative way, what are we making today? A precipitate, but what's the specific identity of the precipitate? Calcium oxalate, exactly right. So the, the marquee reaction that we're looking at today is the reaction between calcium chloride and is it sodium or potassium oxalate? Potassium oxalate. And that in turn yields us a calcium oxalate, which is a solid. As a byproduct, we're going to make two molecules of aqueous potassium chloride. Now, there's a really important subtlety in our mass calculations. Is it pure calcium chloride, or are we dealing with hydrates in this experiment? Hydrates. And the calcium chloride, is it a mono or dihydrate? Yep, so calcium chloride monohydrate. And the reason why this is important is your molar mass is greater than that of the anhydrous salt. Additionally, is potassium oxalate, is, so does it exist as an anhydrous form or as a hydrate? This is something that I want you to check your notebooks and be very careful about. And how many water molecules are associated in the formula? One, okay. So we have potassium oxalate, monohydrate. Does that look okay to everyone based on the lab procedure so far? And now our calcium oxalate. And our calcium oxalate, yes. For the potassium? For the calcium, yep. The calcium chloride is a dihydrate. And the reason why we need to pay attention to the number of absorbed water molecules is it changes your calculation of the molar mass, okay? Looking at calcium oxalate, how many water molecules are associated with our product? When we isolate our pure product, is it going to be a mono, dihydrate, or anhydrous? Let's take a look into our proceed. This is really important that you note these details because it affects our calculations. So take a moment, look over, and tell me, is it a mono or dihydrate? Monohydrate. So we're dealing with calcium oxalate monohydrate. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is it affects the molar mass of our product and it affects how we calculate percent yield and how we calculate the limiting reactant. Okay, so in this experiment, in this experiment, you're going to start off with a solid mix. You're going to start off with a solid mixture containing both of these two hydrates. Now the beauty of this reaction is once this solid mix is added to water and stirred, you will end up generating, you will end up generating in your large beaker, a precipitate. You will end up generating your calcium oxalate. This is known as a textbook precipitation reaction. Now, our two reactants are not in an exact one-to-one -one ratio. There is a slight excess of one of our reagents. So then, in our solution, we would have a small amount, but a non-negligible amount, of our excess reagent. So this can be either calcium chloride or potassium oxalate. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, there's a very unique feature of uh, calcium oxalate. Would someone like to tell me what's the unique feature? Can I just mix these two 
uh, can I just dump my solid mixture into water, stir, and call it a day? No, you have to be a little bit careful. After you've generated your precipitate, you need to subject it to a process known as digestion. And the goal of digestion is to generate easily filtered solid particles. Now, when we think about the process of digesting our precipitate, so one thing to keep in mind is you're gonna to wanna to keep the volume of water to a minimum. The more water you have, the more of your precipitate is gonna dissolve and the less solid you'll be able to isolate. For digestion, once you have your solid mixture, once you have your solid precipitate, and your liquid solution containing your excess reagent, how are we going to digest this mixture? What temperature are we gonna subject it to? Yep, we're gonna heat it to 75 degrees Celsius on a hot plate. And this 75 is the maximum. You do not wanna exceed that temperature. Calcium oxalate is one of the few compounds that actually decreases in solubility as you increase the temperature. Now, after allowing it to digest, you will in turn then have a hot solution. And you're gonna let it sit for 15 minutes. After those 15 minutes, you really want to let your precipitate settle. You want the solid to clump at the bottom and settle. You do not want to have fine particles distributed throughout your solution because those are really hard to filter efficiently. Now, while your solution is still hot, you're going to filter your solution while hot. So you want your solution to still be slightly warm and you're gonna filter it using a Buchner funnel arrangement. So let me draw a picture of a Buchner funnel. So a Buchner funnel is used for vacuum filtration. So here is our funnel and in your funnel, what do we need to place in order for this filter funnel to actually work as a filter? What do we need to place in the funnel? Filter paper, exactly. Okay, and then this funnel is attached to an Erlenmeyer flask, which is hooked up to a vacuum. Now, you're not to hook up your Erlenmeyer flask directly to the vacuum line. Instead, what you're going to do is you're gonna connect your Erlenmeyer that you're performing the filtration through to a separate Erlenmeyer that we call a trap. And what this trap does is ensure that if you're pulling in liquid, the liquid doesn't go straight up into the vacuum line because that damages the vacuum system. Now, this um, trap is going to be connected directly to the vacuum line. So in effect, you're pulling vacuum so the liquid will be pulled through the filter. Now, because calcium oxalate is such a fine powder, you want to make sure that you filter very slowly. So you're gonna filter slowly, and you want to ensure, and I'm gonna draw this with a different color, you want to ensure that your liquid is being passed through the filter and not allowed to pool on the side. So you want all the liquid to directly hit the filter and then go straight through the filter. Now, part of the way that we facilitate this and one of the techniques that I recommend that you use is a technique known first as decanting. So in the process of decanting, what you're doing in the process of decanting is you are removing excess liquid. 
And the reason why I recommend you decant before you filter is you enrich the amount of solid at the bottom of your beaker and it makes it easier to filter quickly and efficiently. So in the process of decanting, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your beaker, which looks a little bit like this, and on the top of the beaker, on the top of the beaker, you're going to thread and place on top a glass rod. And I can show you how to do this practically in the lab. Now, what this glass rod is going to do is it, one, it prevents solid from escaping out of the tip of the beaker, and it allows you to guide the liquid. So when you tilt the beaker, and it contains a solution, what will happen when you tilt the beaker is the glass rod will guide the liquid. And in turn, it allows you to pour out the liquid without losing much of your solid. So this allows you to remove the liquid. I would recommend doing that and then carefully transferring the solid via filtration through a slow and steady pour onto your filter paper. Students often lose material because it does not, the liquid doesn't end up directly hitting the filter paper and the solid just passes through. Does that make sense? Okay, if you ever happen to see solid, if you ever see a large accumulation of solid in the bottom of your Erlenmeyer flask, if you happen to see solid, that's a sign you have to redo this filtration. So slow and steady wins the race. Now, one additional tool that we have to, once we have, once we have our solid, so we've collected on our filter paper, we've collected on our filter paper our solid. Do we have to do anything to our solid before we can weigh it? So we have our filter paper, we have our solid. What are some things that we have to keep in mind? Should we know the mass of our filter paper? Do we need to know the mass of our filter paper? Yes. So you want to make sure you record the mass of your paper without any solid. What else do we need to know? What else do we need to know? What, do, what else do we have to do to the filter paper? Dry it. Dry it. Exactly right. So you're going to take the solid that's found on your, on your filter paper and you're going to dry on a watch glass. And at the end of the process, you're going to record the mass of the paper plus your calcium oxalate. Okay. Now, the key experiment that allows us to identify our limiting and excess reactant is a chemical test. So once you have your supertinent liquid, so after filtration, you will have a large amount of this excess liquid. Now, when I discussed the excess liquid previously, what will the excess liquid solution after filtration contain? What will it contain? If we zoom up to our picture, what will our excess, where will, where will our excess reagent be? In the liquid, in the liquid solution, exactly. So then, what we're going to do is we're going to take this solution and we're going to subject it to a total of two different chemical tests. One, we are going to take a test tube, we're going to place a small amount of our liquid, and then to that test tube, we are going to add calcium chloride. This first test is a test this first test is a test to see if we have oxalate present. So if we oxalate is present, if, if a solid is observed. And if oxalate is present in our liquid, is potassium oxalate gonna be our excess reagent if it's present in the liquid? This is really critical. Let me, let me rephrase this question. We said that in our solution, after filtration, it contains the excess reagent. 
if our calcium chloride test shows us we have oxalate ion present, what is our excess reagent then? If oxalate is present in our filtrate, what does that tell us? Oxalate is excess, exactly. So this, this first test, if we see a solid that tells us that oxalate is the excess reagent, or more specifically, potassium oxalate is our excess reagent. Test number two, in a similar vein, we're gonna take our liquid or the liquid obtained from filtration or the solution obtained from filtration, and we are going to add potassium oxalate. <laughs> Calcium two plus is present in our solution if a solid is observed. Now, what does this tell us about our excess reagent? What is in excess then? If we see, if our test in test number two indicates calcium is present, then what is our excess reagent? Calcium, calcium chloride, exactly. So this tells us we have calcium chloride in excess. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, just to showcase the final calculations, so what you're going to be doing with all of this data is you're gonna know the mass of your mixture. You're gonna know the mass of your mixture, the solid mixture that you use. It's actually even, um, and you'll be able to weigh that out. So you'll know the mass of your mixture, which is equal to the mass of calcium chloride plus, plus the mass of, of potassium oxalate. We'll also know the mass of the solid calcium oxalate obtained from the reaction, right? We can get that by weighing our filter paper. Now, and we can do a trick to figure out the composition of our mixture. So for the first part of our calculation is we're gonna go from the mass of solid calcium oxalate to the moles of calcium oxalate, and this is monohydrate just as a hint. And then from the moles of calcium oxalate, we're gonna go to the moles of our limiting. So the limiting reactant is the one not in excess. So then, whichever component is not in excess, whichever one does not give a positive result in these two tests, either calcium chloride or potassium oxalate, you will use you will be able to identify which of your two reagents is limiting and you'll convert to the moles of your limiting reagent. And then from there, you can convert to the grams of limiting. To show how this pans out in practice, let's pretend that our limiting reagent is calcium chloride. So what that means is that we had a test that is positive for oxalate. So let's pretend calcium chloride is limiting just so I could show you how the calculations function. Everyone clear on that? You may not have calcium chloride as your limiting reagent. I'm just showing you the calculations for right now. So to showcase how we'd set this up, we'd take the grams of calcium oxalate monohydrate and we know that in one mole of calcium oxalate monohydrate, we have how many grams? And you'll need to figure out the molar mass. Does that make sense? We also know, and this is a nice clean chemical equation in that we have a one-to-one -one ratio. We know that we have one mole of calcium chloride reacted for every one mole of calcium oxalate produced. So at the end of this first equation, at the end of this first string, this will give us the moles of calcium chloride that we can then convert to mass, right? We know that there are a certain number of grams in one mole 
of calcium chloride monohydrate. And this, this is why you need to pay special attention to the number of water molecules because your solid mixture is a mixture of hydrates. So then I'm going to trust that you'll be able to figure out this molar mass and tell me the grams of calcium chloride monohydrate, right? We can do that, right? It's just a mole to mass conversion. Now to complete this process and identify the percentage of each component in your mixture, we know that the mass of our excess reagent, the mass of our excess reagent is equal to the mass of our mixture minus the mass of our limiting reagent. The, mi the solid mixture that you're gonna be analyzing has only two components, right? Your limiting reagent and your excess reagent. So then, as a result, you can figure out the mass of the excess reagent by difference. Does that make sense? So let's plug in some, so just some numbers just to show how these calculations would work. If we have a three gram mixture and we figured out we have 1.0 grams of limiting reagent, we'd, we'd then conclude we have 2.0 grams of excess reagent. You can then calculate the mass percent of your excess reagent by taking the mass of your excess over the mass of your mixture times 100%. So just to fill in the blanks here, this would be 2.0 over 3.0 times 100%. Does that make sense? How to calculate mass percent? You can also calculate the mass of unreacted excess. So the mass of unreacted excess. And this requires a little bit more nuance. So to figure out the mass of the unreacted excess reagent, you're gonna start from the mass of our limiting reagent. And for this example, we chose calcium chloride, okay? So from the mass of our limiting reagent, what you're gonna do is you're gonna calculate the moles of our limiting reagent. And because this is a one-to-one -one ratio in our chemical reaction, we can go from our moles of limiting reagent, in this case, calcium chloride, to the moles of excess reacted, in which case this would be our potassium oxalate. This is just a one-to-one -one ratio, so it's not bad at all. And then we can calculate the grams of excess reacted. So this is how much of our excess reagent was actually used up. So for example, we previously supposed we had 1.0 grams of calcium chloride monohydrate. We know that in one mole of calcium chloride monohydrate, there are a certain number of grams. You'll need to fill in the molar mass. We also know that there is one mole of potassium oxalate dihydrate per every one mole of calcium chloride, right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio, as we discussed in the earlier chemical equation. Now, what's a key word? Why, why, do, why do I emphasize dihydrate? Does that affect the mass? Yeah. Yes. So then we need to figure out the grams per one mole of potassium oxalate dihydrate. So once you have that done, you'll get the mass of excess that reacted. Okay, so that's the result of this calculation. The mass of excess remaining, so the mass of excess reagent remaining is equal to the mass of your excess reagent which we've already calculated in step in the earlier portion, right? Minus the mass of the excess 
that reactant. And that would complete your calculations. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions? If we don't have any other questions on the calculations and procedure today, you're welcome to begin.